Tonight on Free Minds TV, we talk about the effect that Department of Homeland Security grants have had on local law enforcement agencies. We'll also be talking about having to show ID to buy Drano, Feeding the Whales, and Ron Paul. Coming up tonight on Free Minds TV. Welcome to episode uh, two, season seven of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick, is yeah. it seven years? It's the seventh year we've been on, yes. Um, so seven, season seven here, second episode of season seven, or the 237th regular show we've done, plus we've had some specials thrown in there as well. So lots of content. It's all up at freemindstv.com. If you want to view any of it, go back in years, see... What we looked like so seven years ago. So the wardrobe changed, the set changed. It did. The, uh, the co-hosts changed. A lot of the issues have stayed the same, yeah. though. Unfortunately, that's the thing that yeah, hasn't really doesn't really look that much different. Yes, predictions have come true. Um, we s touched on this a little bit last week. It was the first episode one of the new season, so we talked a little bit about some of the predictions that have come true today. In the second half of uh, the show, we're going to be showing a prediction from. Um, presidential candidate Ron Paul, who's really the libertarian leading Republican candidate. I know that in New Hampshire the primary season's past us, but it's still pumping hard in other parts of the country, and we're mostly on in other um, state, other markets besides New Hampshire. So I think it's important to put this message out there. And even if he has no hope, getting the message out there about what he's been saying. It's a prediction that goes back 10 years, uh, back in 2002. He uh, addressed Congress and made a whole bunch of predictions, and we'll be showing a video of that, seeing which ones of those came true. It's um, uh, sobering and disturbing. But first, we have some other disturbing news to be getting into. We are going to be talking about um, making it difficult to buy Drano in certain places, also drug testing politicians proposed in Georgia. But first, the Department of Homeland Security wants to beef up police uh, de uh, departments around the country. Yeah, and they've given away $34 billion in grant money since September 11th, 2001. And the, the, the effect that it's had on a lot of local law enforcement agencies is that they now have hardware and equipment that really historically, Toby, would be something you would expect to see military units carrying. They, uh, there's some reporting here from the Daily Beast that focuses in on, um, they point out the example of Fargo, North Dakota, which is a very low crime metro area. They've averaged fewer than two homicides a year since 2005. And they point out here there's not been a single international terrorism prosecution in the last decade. Um, and they've gone on an $8 million buying spree. Uh, every squad car is equipped today with a military-style assault rifle, probably an AR-15. Officers can don Kevlar helmets, able to withstand incoming fire from battlefield-grade ammunition. And for that epic confrontation, if it ever, ever occurs, officers can now summon a new $256,000 armored truck, complete with rotating turret, which it looks like they're going to try to get in Keene. Yeah, me? well, we got a great Ours is free, a little right? bit more expensive. Right. It's, 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 yeah, it's free to the city, I suppose, except you still paid for it through your tax dollars, except it came out of your federal taxes. And the municipalities are going to have to bear the brunt of maintaining this equipment. And, and quite, hiring people to drive right, Training drive people it. Training to use this stuff. I mean, sometimes the training's included in the grant, but only for a period of time. So for a lot of these things, you know, the department's going to have to devote time and financial resources uh, if they want people to be able to use some of the equipment that they've bought. I mean, they point out one city in Texas now, ha which I think we reported on, on the radio show now has a $300,000 pilotless surveillance drone. I think it was uh, um, Montgomery County Sheriff's Department. So th th these things are happening all over the place, Toby. To me, I mean, I can understand how times have changed, and there have been a lot of incidents where police have been killed because they weren't wearing adequate bulletproof vests. I don't know if they need a long arm in every truck, but there have been a number of incidents they point out um, Virginia Tech, the L.A. bank robberies back in 1997, um, and some other incidents that have happened around the world. I mean, to me, it doesn't seem that strange that the police department would have access to rifles because I could see a time where if you are dealing with a crazed shooter, you might need that to respond. But how is this going to prevent terrorism just because the police have long arms and bulletproof vests and armored cars? I mean, a lot of the terrorist incidents you see out there have nothing to do with somebody going on a shooting rampage. And quite often, when that is the case, 
they go on a shooting rampage in a crowded place, it really doesn't last that long, and they're going to kill people regardless. I mean, none of this is really going to prevent a terrorist attack, and I think it's somewhat questionable how, you know, how effective it's going to be in responding. I don't believe officers actually went into Virginia Tech to clear buildings until after the shooter had killed himself in that case. And they had all the fancy hardware, I'm sure. Well, one thing it is very effective at doing is creating a militarized police state. And it's definitely done a very good job at that and spending lots of money. Quick question, is this at Fargo, like where the Coen Brother movie is from? Yeah. So maybe if they had it back then, they could have prevented those murders. They, the cop was killed yeah, in the that, Yeah, the guy would get put in the wood chipper. Yeah. I, it's... If only they had this equipment. How many years ago was that? I think the, the bad guy gets killed with a thirty-eight in that movie, though, doesn't he? Well, snub nose revolver. Oh yeah, most. Oh well. Well, I you know I just I don't I think it does lead to uh, you know a different attitude on police forces, and I also think that for the most part, a lot of this equipment, it's not necessary. It's not that it could never be used, Toby. I mean, of course, you could make a case that well, such and such a scenario could happen, and we could need this stuff. Well, I suppose that's possible. I suppose you could do that with any piece of equipment or any expenditure. But the question you really have to ask is, how cost-effective is this? How, you know, how much of a need is there actually to be spending this money on this equipment? And how that, likely are we to see That the federal it government down? doesn't have. Let's keep that in mind right. as is well. Is it worth it? Because Borrowing that's a, money. That's a question that government agencies quite frequently yeah. ask uh, you know, too seldomly because they are not, you know, they get their money from the taxpayers. You know, there have been budget cutbacks and things like that, depending on what agency you're in. Um, the military certainly hasn't seen it, and, and some police departments have seen cuts, some haven't seen so many. But they're not a business. They don't have to think about things from a business perspective. And the question, is this necessary, do we need this equipment, doesn't really enter into it. I, they don't seriously have to address it. And, you know, we're here in Keene, New Hampshire, 25,000 people, they want to get a 300 $50,000, we've talked about it on the show, $350,000 yeah, armored truck. Video. I don't know when that's going to be used, but they, you know, it's a cool toy, but it doesn't make any sense to be expending money, even grant money on that, I don't think. None at all. It just, in my opinion, militarizes the police and it sets a precedent of taking this grant money and yes, we well, need it now. And it sets a precedent for the future saying, well, we had that equipment in the past when we were paying for it with grants. So we, we, we said we needed an armored truck when the grant was paying for it. What do we do 15 years from now when we need a new armored truck? Need a new armored yeah. truck. Then it'll just be you know, sort of customary and expected that, oh, well, small town police departments need armored vehicles and they need all of this hardware and they don't. Yeah. They just, for the most part, do not. Yeah, well, another um, thing that the government likes to do is track your purchases. They've been doing this with um, over-the-counter medications that you can make meth from for, for years now, and it's starting to expand. Apparently in Illinois, new laws require customers to reach for their identification as well as their cash when they have a clogged drain. The law that took effect Sunday requires a valid identification to buy products containing chemicals listed within the Federal um, Caustic Poison Act um, concentrations that require a warning that says, quote, causes severe burns on the packaging. Targeted substances include hydrochloric and sulfuric acids. Purchasers also must sign a log with their name and address, similar if you want to buy some, is it like Sudafed or something? I don't, I don't Yeah, know. there's there's purchase limits too, and I bel I'm not positive that it's Illinois, but I'm pretty sure they have a, a state limit on it's illegal to buy more than X many milligrams of it in a month, and some, we've done stories where some people have inadvertently run afoul of that if they have a cold or something. They're not terribly high personal use limits. Right. The law was proposed after acid was used as a weapon to cause disfiguring injuries, according to Il the Illinois Senate Republican website. What? It was also used to make methamphetamines. All three legislators in this story said that they did not like placing restrictions on residents or businesses, um, but they said they voted for the measure anyways for the sake of public safety. Uh, people should be able to get used to it, even they, though they don't like it, one of these useless lawmakers said. If people use these products in a proper way, they don't have any problems whatsoever. Um, the initial versions of the law were quite restrictive, encompassing just about anything in the plumbing or cleaning aisles, but the scope was luckily narrowed, said Brad Bobcock, director of the Legislative Affairs uh, Chemical Industry. Industry Council of Illinois. The final version applies to items such as industrial strength clog removers and substantial uh, concentrations of lye or cleaning products containing hi um, 
hydrochloric acid that can clean chimneys. This is what I find the most interesting from these lawmakers. Um, well, failure to comply is first 150, then 500, and then a 1,500 dollar fine for uh, offenses if businesses aren't collecting this information. But this is what's most interesting. Um, these are the lawmakers who say this is this is necessary to stop methamphetamine and for public safety. Although they do admit that uh, people wanting to misuse the substances likely will be able to find ways to circumvent the safeguards. But he, <laughs> so he, they admit that people who were going to buy it to throw it in people's faces or make meth just will easily be able to circumvent the safeguards. So the only people who have to fill out their names and addresses to buy this stuff are the people who are abiding by well, the safe usage of it. I mean, the ma meth manufacturers are just going to have, you know, a friend of their or a criminal associate, just, just somebody who works at a grocery store or a convenience store just steal a whole case or two of liquid plumber. Well, sure, we've actually talked about real meth, the, where the majority of meth comes from. It comes in giant chemical vats, like giant drums shipped in from Mexico. It's not people yeah. going over and buying well, and that's, packages of that's, it. That's a very uh, teeny little right. percentage of I the mean, meth that's created. And methamphetamine is a terrible drug, and I know that oh, this, absolutely. Is, this is always the hard point when we say we need to end the war on drugs because people bring up drugs like methamphetamine, which I don't think would be they would still exist, I think, but they, I don't believe they'd be nearly as prevalent as they are today if it wasn't for drug prohibition, much the same way that we saw Americans shift from beer and wine consumption to hard liquor consumption during alcohol prohibition. But that's true, Toby. And when you put these measures in place that crack down on the small time, in many cases, heavy users who are also paying for their habit by producing a certain amount of methamphetamine, you're, you, essentially what you're incentivizing here is just the guys who do it really well, the Mexican cartels and you know people in the Southwest who are really good at making, you know, running these large commercial meth operations, you're just driving more of the manufacturing to them. And they can probably do it you know, more effectively. They can probably sell the drugs cheaper if they want to compete on price. Has it ever, anyone seen the Heisenberg Hour, Breaking Bad? I love Breaking Bad. It's, it's a, a great, great show. It is. Anyways, um, it, it, my prediction here, an unfortunate prediction, um, this is going to go beyond the medicines and the, the acids and the Drano. Um, and this is going to someday spread to many, many more products. And eventually there's going to be a tracking system for what you buy, whether that's through your credit card or whether you have to have some kind of an identification. Hopefully this is a long way in the future, but it's where we're headed. Because for public safety, the government needs to be able to track what you buy. That's where this is headed. Well, there's a record of everything now, too. It's not just show your ID. I know here in New Hampshire, Toby, age-restricted products, now a lot of the stores are scanning your ID. I don't know if that generates a record or not, but frankly, I don't yeah. particularly care for it. Because essentially what you're doing is you're creating, you know, that data is being placed yeah. in a database somewhere. I don't believe that it's just, you know... It's they're just checking it on the spot and it's not getting recorded. I don't really like the idea of, of tracking people more than the article they, they says here. Do. People don't like it, but they'll get used to it. And guess what? Right now we say no, the people wouldn't stand for the government tracking all our purchases. Well, we wouldn't like it, but we'd get used to it. So that's what people do. Okay, we do need to move on because we have a lot more to get into, Nick. Let's talk about possible jail sentences for feeding the whales. Yeah, um, this, is, this is coming from San Francisco, where a marine biologist who runs popular whale watching tours in California's Monterey Bay has been indicted for violating federal laws that protect marine mammals. I believe it was the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, which I believe is a federal law. Nancy Black, a marine scientist whose work has been featured on PBS, National Geographic, and Animal Planet, was charged Wednesday with four violations of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, she's being accused of feeding killer whales back in 2005, although during a research trip, um, which she claims was for the purpose of conducting scientific research. I guess these orcas or killer whales feed on uh, gray whale calves. Uh, in and around Monterey Bay. So what they did was they actually found some gray whale blubber that was floating on the surface of the ocean you know, from a previous orca attack, and they ran a rope through it, threw the bait, if you want to call it that, into the water so that they could videotape orcas feeding. I don't really know how this is bad for the whales, especially when it's a uh, you know, pretty widely published marine biologist doing it, Toby. It's uh, it's not like she was trying to catch the whales. It's not like she was trying to eat them. She was trying to study 
the whales. If she's found guilty of, uh, there was some videotape that was taken of this as well. Um, the feds are claiming that she edited it before she gave it to them. If she's found guilty of editing the video, um, she could receive a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison and half a million dollars in fines. She can't videotape? I thought that was the whole purpose. She can't edit the video. This is no. silly. No, okay. I, I, apparently you can't edit the video. All right. I mean, you, you and I videotape stuff, Toby. It's very rare that we keep raw footage around because a lot of it's junk. It would take up a lot of space. Yeah. I have a I big mean, drawer, but it filled up. So any, I just anybody who takes video garbage. of stuff knows that, yeah, raw footage, especially if you're filming, you know, I would imagine filming in a you know, filming wildlife, you probably get a lot, a lot of junk. Oh, there's some waves. There's some empty ocean. You know, Nick, I just think it's silly. This is what... This is what the tax dollars are going towards, is prosecuting this poor woman? Really? Really? Is that, is that what people want out there? Right, and arguably somebody, Toby, who's probably doing, I mean, if you're a marine biologist, you do a lot of you know, work studying whales. You know, it's not, she wasn't running a whaling vessel in Monterey Bay. I mean, she was, she's a, this is probably one of the people who is trying to help marine mammals, but you know, just because of the way the federal laws have been written, you know, they, they're, they're written in a way that's sufficiently broad enough that you can catch people up. There doesn't need to be an intent to harm marine life. Um, and this, th you know, this kind of overcriminalization happens all over the place. I mean, there's so many federal laws and regulations on the books that even people, you know, you'd think that marine biologists would be very conscious of this act, but I don't know how long the Marine Mammal Protection Act sure, is. but the silly fools... I don't know what's in it. The silly fools who are enforcing these laws don't have the foresight to say, oh, no, this isn't what the law was written for, and move along. And that's no. what... Uh, well, and this is the... Yeah, I mean, they're still expending resources on stuff like this, Toby, while at the same time, you know, the, we're in a situation where, you know, there are a lot of hungry children sure. out there. Have you There's caught a lot all of the rapists, all, all the killers, yeah. all the serial killers? Uh, are, are they, they all been taken care of? All the vi violent criminals. So we, we've taken I think care of them. I so think double parking <laughs> would be like one up on the list from this. From to being be honest. the whale. Yeah. Uh, the the whale. Thing. In my, Over. you know, in my, uh, but apparently the people in government don't really view things the same way that we do, Toby. But in my mind, double parking would be just a notch above this. Well, Nick, if 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 this law goes through in Georgia, at least, I think that we could solve issues like this because I think a lot of these laws might. And I'm going to just go ahead and say allegedly might uh, be created by lawmakers who might be under the substance of some kind of illicit chemical. <laughs> and in Illinois, they might put a stop to this. Um, if a bill filed by the Democratic state legislator in Republican-dominated Georgia, Georgia Gem General Assembly could have some interesting implications for the state's open records law. Clearly, a political response to legislative proposals filed by the state, House, and Senate that would subject applicants of public assistance, welfare, testing, um, to drug testing, a bill filed by the Atlantic De uh, Democrat Scott Holcomb would subject legislators to the same drug testing. So this is a bill, and we've talked about others like this, that would essentially say that if you're going to uh, be in state government passing laws, you've got to take a drug test and pee into a cup. Um, and that's what the, they're proposing that they do with welfare recipients as well. Although I think it's a great idea, hilarious, to make the lawmakers pee in the cup, uh, the language becomes useless because apparently the legislators are exempt from public records laws. So this would make it public record if any of them were positive for drugs, but the public would never get to see it because the state legislators, the lawmakers, they're exempt from the public record law. I don't know why that is, but I guess they're above the law in that sense. Not too surprised. Yeah. And I, it'll probably fail. We've talked about others like well, we've talked about, before. Yeah, we've, we've talked about this idea before because this idea of testing welfare recipients and others for drugs often comes up, but frankly, State reps in most places, senators. Um, yeah, they're receiving public federal funds representatives. Anyways. Right, they are receiving. I mean, you're going to say, well, these these people receiving welfare or some kind of assistance are taking my money, so we shouldn't be giving it to them if they're using drugs. Well, what about the politicians? What about all the government employees? Mm. To me, I think you can make a much more direct case for drug testing. You know, people in government who are actually making the laws and people in the bureaucracies who are enforcing them. You know, if if they're going to apply a certain standard to the average person. Who, you know, the average welfare recipient, shouldn't we be drug testing our senators and state reps more frequently? 
Sure. Judges on Supreme Courts should be tested as well, I think. All the courts. It's funny when they, we have talked about cases where they... If we're going to have if we're going to have this paradigm sure. where the government's going to be cracking down the average people for it, then I think it's necessary and appropriate. It just yeah. makes common sense. We've to talked me. about many cases where they do start drug testing uh, police departments and stuff, and a lot of them show up positive. Hmm. Funny how that works. They don't get fired, of course. They get, they get a slap on the wrist. In many cases, sometimes they get fired. All right, we do need to move <laughs> along here, Nick. Uh, we've got uh, predictions from Ron Paul. Now, we're going to show the video first, and then we'll discuss it a little bit afterwards. But this is Ron Paul in 2002 addressing the House of Representatives. And then it shows on the background some of the predictions that he's saying. Some of them have come true. Let's take a look. The private affairs of citizens and the internal affairs of foreign countries leads to uncertainty and many unintended consequences. Here are some of the consequences about which we should be concerned. I predict U.S. taxpayers will pay to rebuild Palestine, both the West Bank and the Gaza, as well as Afga Afghanistan. U.S. taxpayers pay to bomb these areas, so we will be expected to rebuild them. Peace of sorts will come to the Middle East, but will be short-lived. There will be big promises of more U.S. money and weapons flowing to Israel and to Arab countries allied with the United States. U.S. troops and others will be used to monitor the peace. In time, an oil boycott will be imposed with oil prices soaring to historic highs. Current Israeli-United States policies will solidify Arab-Muslim nations in their effort to avenge the humiliation of the Palestinians. This will include those Muslim nations that in the past have fought against each other. Some of our moderate Arab allies will be overthrown by Islamic fundamentalists. The UN will continue to condemn through resolutions Israeli-US policies in the Middle East and they will be ignored. Some European countries will clandestinely support the Muslim countries and their anti-Israel pursuits. China, ironically assisted by American aid, much more openly will sell the militant Muslims the weapons they want and will align herself with the Arab nations. The United States, with Tony Blair as head cheerleader, will attack Iraq without proper authority and a major war, the largest since World War II, will result. Major moves will be made by China, India, Russia, and Pakistan in Central Asia to take advantage of the chaos for the purpose of grabbing land, resources, and strategic advantages sought after for years. The Karzai government will fail and U.S. military presence will end in Afghanistan. An international dollar crisis will dramatically boost interest rates in the United States. Price inflation with a major economic downturn will decimate U.S. federal government finances and exploding deficits and uncontrolled spending. Federal Reserve policy will continue at an expanding rate with massive credit ex expansion, which will make the dollar crisis worse. Gold will be seen as an alternative to paper money as it returns to its historic role as money. Erosion of civil liberties here at home will continue as our government responds to political fear in dealing with the terrorist threat by making generous use of the powers obtained with the Patriot Act. Many American military personnel and civilians will be killed in the coming conflict. The leaders of whichever side loses the war will be hauled into and tried before the International Criminal Court for war crimes. The United States will lose the war, but neither will we win. Our military and political leaders will not be tried by the International Criminal Court. The Congress and the President will shift radically toward expanding the size and scope of the federal government. This will satisfy both the liberals and the conservatives. Military and police powers will grow, satisfying the conservatives. The welfare state, both domestic and international, will expand, satisfying the liberals. Both sides will endorse military adventurism overseas. This is the most important of my predictions. Policy changes could prevent all of the previous predictions from occurring. Unfortunately, that will not occur. In due course, the Constitution will continue to be steadily undermined and the American Republic further weakened. During the next decade, the American people will become poorer and less free, while they become more dependent on the government for economic security. 
The war will be will prove to be divisive with emotions and hatred growing between the various factions and special interests that drive our policies in the Middle East. Agitation from more class warfare will, will succeed in dividing us domestically. And believe it or not, I expect lobbyists will thrive more than ever during the dangerous period of chaos. I have no timetable for these predictions, but just in case, keep them around and look at them in five to ten years. Let's hope and pray that I'm wrong on all accounts. If so, I will be very pleased. Gentleman has expired. Unfortunately, he has not been wrong on most accounts. I think that we haven't seen soaring interest rates yet. Um, um, no, I mean we haven't seen the inflation. But I think we have seen. I mean, you and I, I were. I think we've seen a significant right. amount of inflation. It's just happened over ten years, so it hasn't right. hit people immediately. With a hard. lot, yeah, I remember we've seen it completely. Remember erode what? The middle remember class. what? Food, I mean, a lot of people don't. But remember when we were complaining about how food prices were going up and up and up? Well, they did, and back in 2002, that wasn't the case. It was a lot cheaper to shop at the grocery store. It was the cheapest in the, in the entire history of the world. Right. And there might be the there are some food. other so, other factors. As, you know, when you're dealing with things like food, when you're dealing, with, I think our fuel policy played into that. And but if you look at the reason why the cost of a lot of raw materials have gone up, Toby, in part it has been because the U.S. dollar has been weakening. We have seen U.S. government finances weakening, and the stage has been yeah. set for a dollar crisis. I don't think too many people would argue that. There's much more potential now than there was 10 years ago. It is weird looking at that. That was in 2002. And I know that a lot of that stuff for, to us, yes, that this is obvious, especially watching that show. Well, that is was that was 10 years ago. He was saying those things, practically speaking about the, the Occupy movement and the, the, the stuff that's going on. He really was predicting that because he's been solid and he's been able to predict essentially predict the future by looking at government policy for the last well he's been saying the same thing for 25 30 years yeah, yeah well I mean he's, he's applying you know he's applying a bit his basic framework for looking at the world and he's certainly not perfect nobody no. is nobody's got a crystal ball um, and he certainly doesn't always you know he, he doesn't even try to get the timing but observing general trends you know I, I think if you look at what he has said over the years he has been fairly accurate because he's just been looking at policy realistically yep. well we're out of time for this week I'd say if you're in one of those states ha hasn't had their primary yet well maybe look into Ron Paul a little bit more it's better than another Obama or Romney which is Obama well basically anybody else who's running I don't care yeah it doesn't so really make any difference. I've got I've got somebody to vote for this year I guess whether they'll win or not I don't care yeah Anyways, Personally. out of time for this week. It's been Toby here with you. And Nick. FreeMindsTV.com. In the meantime, ways to contact us, all the archives of the show, and ways to help us out if you like us. Until next time, have a good week.